Well, Happy New Year. It's good to see you today. Glad that uh, you're starting the year off right, all right? You've got perfect attendance so far, Sunday morning worship. So well done, good job. You know, and I kind of think, I I snuck a peek when Will was talking earlier when he asked for a show of hands about resolutions, and I feel right at home because I feel like I'm in a group of people here who are a little bit like me, who you're a little bit cynical maybe about New Year's resolutions. So that's, that's kind of good. Maybe, you know, you're a little jaded uh, about making them. I don't know. Or maybe you were just not wanting to, to raise your hand. Maybe you weren't awake yet. I'm not sure. But here's the thing. There is something in us as human beings that when the calendar turns from December 31st to January 1st, there's something in us that that gets a little bit hopeful, that gets a little bit excited about fresh starts. Isn't that right? That, that, I mean, do you feel that? Is, that? is that true, that there's something about the turn of the calendar that just says maybe something from this past year, maybe it'll be better in the new year? right? This is going to be the year, right? We, we start to think that way. This is the year that I am going to get in shape. This is going to be the year that, that I clean out the garage, right? This is going to be the year, right, that I do a better job managing my time, I make more time for family and friends and spend less time on social media and playing Candy Crush or or whatever it is you do uh, to, to waste time, right? I mean, we start thinking of all these things that the new year could possibly bring about. We're gonna learn a new hobby. We're gonna read more books, those kinds of things. You know, I read a book a couple of years ago um, that was talking about One word, pick one word for the year. It talked about, you know, instead of resolutions, pick a word and that's gonna be the word that you just look to see how God is going to use that word in your life over the year. And when I got to the end of the book, I said, wait a minute, I've been tricked. This is just a fancy, sneaky way of getting me to make a resolution, right? But, But maybe that's your thing. Maybe that's what you do. I'm gonna have a word for the year and that is what you do to start a new year. Maybe... You know, I'm speaking to a room full of people who are starting their new year at church, and so I think I'm speaking to a group of people who would relate to maybe in 2023, one of the things you want to see happen is your walk with God deepen. You want to grow spiritually. You want to know him better. You want to spend more time in his word. Maybe this is the year that you're saying, I'm committing to reading through the Bible, in an, the entire Bible, in one year span. Maybe you said, you know, I've recognized this past year has shown me how much I need Christian community in my life. I need God's people around me for comfort, for encouragement, for care, for accountability. And so this is going to be the year that I'm going to commit to being in a Bible study. I'm going to commit to being in a growth group, a Sunday school class. And I'm so excited about that. I can't wait to see you next week at 9 or at 1030 over in the Family Life Building in one of our growth groups. We've got a lot of great ones, so I can't wait to see you next week because I know next week that is one of your resolutions, right? You're going to get in a growth group if you haven't been in one. Amen? Amen. All right. Commercial over. You know, but here's the thing. Here's the bottom line. The new year affords us, and it really almost forces us to take a look at the things in our life that aren't quite right. Right? And some of us do a better job at masking those things that aren't quite right than others. Right? We, 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 can, we can hide it better, but we all know, like even sitting here this morning, you already know when we've just started the year, you already know those things in your life that, that just aren't quite right. And I'm not talking about the superficial stuff, right? The few extra pounds or, or something like that. I mean the real stuff, the stuff that just can rob you of your joy, the stuff that can suck the life out of you. Some of you are facing real challenges, right? The turn from December 31st to January 1st did not change the fact that maybe you are facing circumstances that are so much bigger than you. They didn't change the fact that there is a need in your life that only can be met by Jesus Christ. 
right? A calendar doesn't change those things. And so maybe you're sitting here today and you said, you know, yeah, it's a new year, but there's some things in my life that are heavy. There's some challenges. There's some obstacles. There's some things going on in my life that, I've, that in the new year, I want to see answers. So I want to ask you this morning, if you're honest with yourself, what areas of your life need life breathed into them? Where do you need streams of living water to flow again in your life in a fresh way? As we talk about a new year, a fresh start, a new time. That's the question today. And I want you to begin thinking about that now. Where is it you need that in your life? Think about those areas. Because as we go to God's word, I believe this morning, we're going to see out of the pages of God's word, how he wants to speak to us in those areas and what he wants to do to satisfy and to fill and to renew and to refresh us. So if you have a copy of God's word, open it to the gospel of John chapter four. In John's gospel, we read about Jesus's interaction in chapter four with a Samaritan woman. It's the only one of the gospel writers who includes this account, but it's really one of the most well-known passages and encounters that Jesus has with an individual during his earthly ministry. And in this passage, in John chapter four, Jesus makes an incredibly bold claim. And I want us to look at that to start the morning here. Look with me at John chapter four in verse 14. Look at what Jesus says. We're gonna pick up the whole story in just a minute, but right in the story, right as he's talking to this woman at the well, the Samaritan woman, he says this, huge, bold, audacious claim. He says, whoever drinks the water This water in the well will thirst again, but whoever drinks the water that I will give him will never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. That's a big claim and we read that. You may know that passage and and you may read over that and think, okay, that's great, but if you were the Samaritan woman with Jesus at the well at this moment. And Jesus said to you, I've got something for you. I've got water for you that if you drink this water, you will never know thirst again. You will be satisfied for all of eternity. Not only will you not be thirsty, but you will have a spring of water welling up inside of you that is life-giving, that is life-producing. That's a big claim, is it not? So let me ask you this morning, friend, have you experienced that? Have you experienced that water that Jesus is talking about? Child of God, is that your experience? Could you describe your walk with Jesus in this way? Is it refreshing? Is it satisfying? Is it thirst quenching? Is it renewing? Is it refreshing? Is it life giving? Is the evidence of your life, is your testimony one that says, There is a well of water, of living water within me that produces life. That's what is possible. That is what is ours through Jesus Christ. And so this morning, I want us to take a minute and look at this text because many times when we approach this passage of scripture in John chapter four, we start to think about how this woman was a social outcast, how she was maybe less than, how she had a past, how, and how God met her there in her need, and, 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 he, and he did something. He did a work of transformation in her life, and that is very true. That is a correct understanding, but there's so much more in this passage, and so today, what I want us to see that I believe this passage of Scripture helps us understand is that we need to continually be drinking from the stream of living water that is found in Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. And here's the thing, because many of you probably know this passage of scripture, 
I think it's important that we actually read it. But I wanna challenge you this morning to follow along in your copy of God's word. And if you don't have one, there's a Bible in front of you in the pew rack. Grab that, follow along, even take that with you if you don't have a Bible. But I want you to read it. I'm not gonna put it up on the screen because I want you to look at the pages of God's word. And I want you to listen, and I want you to listen with fresh ears, and I want you to read it with fresh eyes, and just allow the word of God to just wash over you as we read this encounter. And if you can, read it today like you've never heard it before. John chapter four, I'm gonna pick up in verse number three. And it says, he left Judea and he went away again into Galilee and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus being wearied from his journey was sitting thus by the well and it was about the sixth hour. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And therefore the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you being a Jew ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And she said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with. This well is deep. Where do you get that living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you? Who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle? And Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way here to draw water. And he said to her, go, call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you have correctly said, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. You have said truly. And so the woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet, and our fathers worshiped in the mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, and we worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know the Messiah is coming. He who is called the Christ. And when he comes, he will declare all things to us. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. And at this point, his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with a woman and yet no one said, what do you seek? Or or why do you speak with her? Verse 28, so the woman left her water pot and went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things that I have done. Could this be the Christ? And they went out of the city and were coming to him. God, would you take your word this morning? God, would you be our teacher? Would you speak to us through your word? God, would you reveal truth to us? God, may we apply it to our lives and leave here changed in Jesus' name. Amen. So the Samaritan woman, like I said a minute ago, many times we we look at her and we start to say, well, she's different than me. 
right? What is it about her? Why would we go to this passage today when we want to look at the new year and think about a fresh start? When, when, I, when I pose a question this morning about where is it in your life that you need streams of water, that you need refreshing and renewal in your life, why would we go and why would I say we need to learn something from this woman that Jesus encounters at the well? Because you may say, well, I, I'm not in the same situation. I don't have that same background. I don't have that same testimony, right? My life is, is not like hers. Maybe you've got a sense of my life is a little, little more put together than hers. I'm not quite that much of a mess. I may have areas of my life where I need Christ to work, but, but I'm not like her. But here's what I want us to see this morning. There are so many things about this text and about what's going on here and about the Samaritan woman that we really do relate to, if we're honest. And the first thing I want us to see this morning is that we have some of the same tendencies that she had. Look back at the passage with me for just a minute. First of all, I want you to think with me about what happens just before John chapter four. If you're looking at headings in your Bible, who is Jesus talking to in John chapter three? Nicodemus, I heard it, good job. He's talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus socially, professionally, right? Religiously, he would have been the opposite of this woman at the well. He was respected, he was educated, he was religious, he was put together, he was by the world's definition successful. And then right after Jesus interacts with Nicodemus, now he must, as the scripture tells us, he had to go to Samaria to meet with someone we would say was on the opposite end of the spectrum. But I want you to think with me. They had the exact same need. There was no difference spiritually between these two. They both needed Jesus. Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. He tells the woman at the well, you must drink of the living water that I provide. In other words, you are not the source of life for yourself. I am the source. They are, they are, they are so much the same. I believe John sets these two examples and these two encounters with Jesus side by side to show us that it doesn't matter what your station is in life, whether you are successful or whether you're not, whether your, your past is not full of things that you would like to change or whether it it is, whether you are financially successful or you struggle from paycheck to paycheck, whether you feel like you're respected and, and admired and looked up to, or whether you feel like nobody knows you. John sets these two examples side by side to say, Jesus is the answer to both, that our social standing matters not. All that matters is what are we doing with, what have we done with Jesus? That's why he sets them together like this. And we've got some of the same tendencies as the woman at the well. The first one I think we notice here in verses six and seven is that we have a tendency like she does to avoid uncomfortable situations through unhealthy patterns. We don't have time to dig into everything about the text, so we're gonna go quickly through these. But she's coming to the well at an hour when you don't go to the well. She's avoiding people because she is, she's ashamed. She feels like an outcast. And, and because of her past, because of her five husbands, and, and now that she's choosing to live with a, with a man who's not her husband, she's, she's not really welcome at the well when all the other women go to the well first thing in the morning. So she comes at noon, at the sixth hour, at a time when nobody else comes. So she wants to avoid uncomfortable situations and so she adapts some really unhealthy patterns and habits in order to avoid situations that she doesn't really want to face. Have you ever been there? Have you ever done that? She also has a tendency to believe wrongly about herself. In verse nine, she says, Jesus, why are you talking to me? You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you're a man, I'm a woman. She has this, this low view of herself. Part of that is cultural, sure, but part of that is also the lies that she believes about herself. 
Can I tell you that we have a tendency to believe the wrong things about ourselves? Sometimes we think too much of ourselves and sometimes we think far too little of the fact that we are made in the image of God and that he purchased us with his blood on the cross to redeem us to himself. We can get in either ditch, but we have the tendency to believe wrong things about ourselves just like she was. We have a tendency to doubt and to be skeptical. When Jesus offers her living water, she says, who are you? She says, you don't have anything to draw water with. Yeah, right. How are you gonna do that? Are you greater than our father Jacob? I love that Jesus doesn't even answer her. I mean, he could have said, yeah. <laughs> but he didn't, did he? he? He doesn't even answer the question, but she's got doubts. She's skeptical. Here Jesus is offering her living water. He's offering her a fresh start, new life, to experience life instead of shame and regret. And she's doubtful. She's sitting back skeptical, like, I don't know about that. Sounds too good to be true. Maybe you're here today, and maybe that's where you find yourself. You've heard the claims of Christ. You've heard people stand up and read scripture and teach scripture. Maybe you've been in church all your life, but if you're honest, you live like a skeptic. It's never gone from something you've heard and understand intellectually to something that you've actually placed your faith in to live out like it were true. You're a skeptic. You doubt whether what Jesus says really is something that you can rely on. There's other ways we have some of the same tendencies. She had this desire to look for a quick fix, a quick solution, a patch to her problem, didn't she? When Jesus offered her that living water, what did she say? Oh, give me that water so that I don't have to come back to this well again. I don't wanna face my problems anymore, right? I don't wanna have to have a constant reminder every day about the choices that I've made and the mess that my life is in. I don't wanna, I don't wanna think about it, so just give me a quick fix. Let's just, let's just deal with the symptoms of the problem rather than really get to the root of what is going on. Guilty. Guilty, if I'm honest with you, I have that tendency. Let's just clean up the outside. Let's just, let's just deal with the symptom rather than getting to the root of what's going on. Is that you? And then the last thing, the last tendency that I think we share with her that we see in this text is our tendency to believe wrongly about worship. In verse 20, she says, she, she changes, she takes the subject and she starts talking about worship after Jesus kind of pinpoints kind of where she is in life, that she's had five husbands and she's now living with, with a sixth man. And she says, oh, well, let's talk about worship, right? And we'll get to that in a minute. But, the, but right now, understand, she's believing the wrong things about worship. Worship is man-centered to her at this moment. In this moment in time, she's thinking about it from a man-centered perspective. What do I need to do, right? What do I need to do to fix myself, right? She's, she's got this false understanding about who the true object of her worship should be. So we've got some of the same tendencies, but we also have the same need. We have the same need. If we are gonna understand our need to continually drink from the stream of living water found in Christ, we have to understand that we have some of the same tendencies as this lady at the well, but we also have the exact same need for water, for living water. Think about what water does. Water quenches our thirst. Water is the source of, it's, it's, it's life preserving. Water is cleansing, right? Water produces fruit, right? Things don't live without water. Now think about that spiritually. It's not a far jump to be able to think that way then to say, okay, well, if that's what, what physical water does, when we're talking about the spiritually, when we're looking at living water, do we need it? 
Do we need a source of life? Do we need our thirst quenched? Does this world sometimes just dry us up and do we need to be refreshed and renewed spiritually? Do we need to be cleansed spiritually? Do we need the ability to produce fruit, to let who we are in Christ show to those around us who do not know him? Absolutely, we need living water. But we also need the source of living water. I don't miss that. Jesus says in here in verse 10, he says, he would give you living water. Verse 14, he says, I will give living water. He is identifying himself as the source of living water. You know, and that's always been humanity's need. We are not alone. We are not the first people to be in need of living water. All of scripture shows us. It shows us man's attempt to dethrone God, man's attempt to be their own God, man's attempt to be their own source of truth and their own source of life and their own source of direction and purpose and we fail miserably. We can look at page after page of scripture of how mankind has attempted to be their own source of everything. And Jesus says, I am the source of life. 700 years before Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at the well, the prophet Isaiah utters these words that are given him by God. I want you to listen to these out of Isaiah chapter 41. Listen to verse 17 and 18. He says, the afflicted and the needy are seeking water, but there is none and their tongue is parched with thirst. He says, I, the Lord, Yahweh, will answer them myself. As the God of Israel, I will not forsake them. I will open rivers on the bare heights and springs in the midst of the valleys. I will make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. Israel was a thirsty people. They were in desperate need of life. They were in desperate need of that water. And God says, I am that source of life. I am that water. And he promises them that, hey, I know you're getting ready to go into captivity, but I am still at work and I am going to provide for you a source of life and refreshment that will be life and water and renewal for your soul. 700 years later, Jesus stands by the well. The spiritual climate is exactly the same as it was in Isaiah's day. And Jesus says, I am that living water. I am the source of that water. Your need is the same need as generations before you and generations before them and generations before and before all the way back to the fall. He says, I am the source of the living water. He alone was the one who could provide water in the wasteland. Look back at verse 14 in John chapter four again. He says, whoever drinks this water that I give him will never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. What's he talking about here? He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's talking about the Holy Spirit who would come to indwell those who place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Because that's what living water is. Living water is the continual renewing and refreshing work of love and grace by the indwelling Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. That's what it is. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what he's promising. That's what he's offering to this woman at the well is to experience the love of God, the grace of God in her life, but not just to experience one time, but for it to be an indwelling presence in her life that will be a constant source of life and refreshment and renewal for her very soul. Amen? Church, that is what is ours through Jesus Christ. If you're sitting here today and you do not know Jesus Christ, that is the offer that he is extending to you, just like he did to the Samaritan woman 2,000 years ago, is to drink from the water that he provides, that gives life. 
We have the same tendencies. We have the exact same need. And we must respond to the same invitation. See, Jesus offered the water. But did she, was was the woman at the well going to drink? Was she going to accept this invitation to living water? Was she going to, as the psalmist said in Psalm 34, verse 8, was she going to taste and see that the Lord is good? Or was she going to just continue to do what she had always done and hope for different results? Or was she going to change? Was she going to repent? Was she going to turn? And was she going to accept this invitation from the Lord Jesus in this moment? It was an invitation for her to receive something that she did not have. It was an invitation for her to confront her sin. Jesus offers this water and she says, sir, that sounds like a really good thing. Give me that water. And what does Jesus do? He says, hey, go call your husband. Come back and then we'll talk. And she says, I have no husband. What is Jesus doing? He's forcing her to confront her own sin. Because here's the deal, longing for something new, longing for a fresh start, longing for change in your life is not enough. It's not just a longing, it requires confronting and being brought face to face with our sin and laying it down at the foot of the cross. In dealing with the sin in our life, Can I encourage you today? You can long, and it's good to long for a fresh start. It's, It's good to identify those areas in our life where we need God to work. But if we're not willing to lay down our sin and to repent, we're never going to experience the living water that is ours in Jesus Christ. We never will. So it is an invitation to confront sin But I love this, don't miss this, this is so important. It was an invitation to confront sin that was based on the character of God. I love how Jesus deals with her sin in this moment. He doesn't beat her up, he doesn't stand in judgment, he doesn't look down on her, he's gentle. He's kind, he's loving. Right? He doesn't say, let's dig into your problem, right? Why, why, why have you had so many husbands? Let's talk about that, right? Let's really get to what's going on. You know, what, what's going on in your life, right? Are, are you looking for your value? Are you trying to find it? No, he doesn't do all of that. He just says, hey, I know you've got stuff. You've got sin. You've got things in your life that have brought you to the place you are today. I don't want to talk about that. I want to offer you something new. I wanna give you a fresh start. That's the God that we serve. In John chapter one, John describes Jesus as being full of grace and truth. He is both. Do we have to confront and deal with our sin if we're gonna come to Jesus? Absolutely. But is he full of grace and mercy to forgive and restore and redeem us? Absolutely. He's full of grace and truth and that's how he addresses the woman in this passage of scripture. So we can trust him. Why can we confront our sin? Because he's kind, because he's loving, because scripture tells us he took our sin upon himself. You know, I think of, uh, as I read this text and I thought about how Jesus dealt with the Samaritan woman and in her sin, it reminded me of my dad. Some of you guys know my dad passed away about 11 years ago, but oh man, I love my dad. I miss my dad. One of the things I love so much about my dad was, looking back, was the way that he disciplined. We have a joke in our family among me and my siblings about, man, you know, there were times we didn't really like it when, you know, when we got that, you know, that, 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 those dreaded words from mom of wait till you're Father comes home, right? We didn't like that. We joke about that because here's what would happen. We were still going to get in trouble. We were still going to get our tail whipped or, or what, you know, whatever was going to happen, right? But 
dad would always come in the room. You know, mom, if you did something wrong, you just got it, right? The, the ruler, the belt, the spoon, the switch, whatever was her pleasure of the moment to use, um, whatever she could find, right? You just got it. You did something wrong. She told you you did something wrong, and she dealt with it, and you moved on, right? That wasn't the way dad did it. Dad come in, waited all day. He'd come home, he'd sit down on the edge of your bed, and he'd want to talk. And you knew what was coming on the other side of the talk. And you just wanted to get it over with, but he just wanted to talk and talk. And it just, I mean, you were just sitting there like sweating, you know, shaking, like, okay, when's this gonna happen? When's this gonna happen? You know, but looking back now, some of those talks, oh, I miss some of those. (laughs) Even in those moments where I was rotten. Um, Why? Because my dad wanted me to understand that even though my sin had to be dealt with, he loved me. And he valued his relationship with me. And he wanted me to understand that even though he had to deal with the sin in my life, it didn't change our relationship. That's the way our Heavenly Father wants to deal with us. He's kind. It's an invitation to deal with our sin, but to do it based on his character. It's also an invitation to worship. When the woman changed the subject, right? And I've read this passage so many times, and so many times I thought when Jesus says, hey, go call your husband, come back, and then we'll talk about living water. She goes, hey, let's talk about worship. I thought this is just a subject change, right? She's wanting to avoid what Jesus is talking about, so she just changes the subject, and maybe that's true, but I wanna propose something else. Remember I said that we have to correct, we have a tendency to think wrongly about worship. I think that's what she's doing here. I think she knows she needs to deal with her sin. I think she's even leaning into, yeah, you're right. I need to do something about this. But what does she do? She immediately goes to what do I need to do, right? Should I go to the mountain to worship where the Samaritans go? Or should I go to the temple and worship where you Jews go, even though I'm not allowed to go there, right? She's asking questions. She's leaning in. In, but it's all about what does she need to bring to the table? What does she need to do in order to clean herself up? That's not the invitation. Jesus is not offering her an invitation to clean herself up. He's offering her a different invitation. That invitation is based on the cross. It's based on the truth of the gospel, this living water that he offers. He's saying it's not about what you're going to do to find God. It's about what he has done to find you. See, Jesus says, I've come. I'm the living water. You don't clean yourself up in order to receive it. You receive it because I came to where you are. Church, that's the beauty of what we have in the gospel message as followers of Jesus Christ. Every other religion in the world is man's attempt to get to God. The truth of scripture tells us what we know, what we have in the gospel is that God came to us. He entered in, he is Emmanuel. He came to be with us and he came to pay the price of our sin for us so that we could know him, so that we could have his presence within us as this source, this fountain of living water. It's an invitation to new life. I love the change, and we don't have time to spend a lot of time on this, but just think with me for a minute about what we read. Think about the change in her life. Verse 29, it says, she immediately set down her water jar, and she ran back to town. Who was in town? All the people that she had been spending a lot of her life avoiding. And what did she do? She went to town and said, hey, come see a man. Come see a man who told me everything about myself. Could he be the one? Could he be the one? This doesn't sound anymore like this woman who was hiding in shame, in regret. This sounds like someone now who's tasted and seen that the Lord is good. 
This is someone who now has found their identity and their worth and their longings met and satisfied, truly satisfied in the person of Jesus. What's the bottom line? You and I will never have our thirst quenched if we don't first acknowledge our need for water. You know, during the holidays, um, I found out something. Every year I find this out about myself, that even when I'm not hungry, I'll eat. (laughs) You know, I'm not hungry, but man, that fudge looks good. Right? You there? You there with me? Oh, got a lot more hands that time. All right, that's good. But you know something? I don't just think, you know, I'd like a drink of water when I'm not thirsty. Why do I want water? Because I know I'm thirsty. We don't have time to get into this, but you know what? A lot of times when I'm thirsty, I try to satisfy that thirst with a lot of things besides water. Soft drinks, sweet tea, coffee. Ultimately though, will any of those things really satisfy and quench our thirst? No, we need water. We've got to admit we're thirsty if we are going to have our thirst quenched spiritually. We have to admit that we are a thirsty people, that we need living water. Church, this morning, we've set aside some time in our service here as we begin to wrap up to come around the Lord's table together. So at this time, some of our deacons are gonna begin to move through the aisle. And as you came in today, if you did not get a set of the elements, just slip your hand up right now and they will, they will find you over the next few minutes and they will bring you a set of these Let me give you, by way of instruction, just a couple of things. The Lord's Supper, as we come to remember Christ's body that was broken and his blood that was shed for us, this remembrance that we are commanded to do in Scripture, this is for believers. If you are here today and you've never placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you are in the right place. We are so glad that you are here. There is no better place you could be today. But the invitation for you today is to receive the living water that is offered through the finished work of Jesus on the cross. And if you've never placed your faith in Jesus, that is your act of worship Your act of obedience today is to bow a knee and surrender your life to Jesus. What we're going to do right now is for those of us who have done that. So if you are here today and you have placed your faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I wanna invite you this morning to prepare your heart for this time of remembrance, for this special sacred time of worship as we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross. First Corinthians chapter 11, verse 26, Paul says that for as often as we do this, for as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, he says that we are proclaiming the Lord's death until he returns. This morning, As we do this, we are are proclaiming, Jesus, your death on the cross, your broken body and your shed blood means that I am not enough, that there is nothing I can do to save myself. I am not the source of life. I do not belong on the throne of my life. Only you do, King Jesus, because you took my sin. 
you who knew no sin became sin for me so that I could be clothed in your righteousness. That is what we're proclaiming today. Just like the invitation offered to the woman at the well was for her to admit she wasn't enough. She couldn't clean up her own life. She needed the living water of Jesus to cleanse her and to renew her. What a better picture of that this morning for us to remember that our testimony, if we've placed our faith in Jesus, is that there was a point when we bowed our knee and we said, I am not enough. Jesus, I need you to cleanse me of my sin. I need you to be the king of my life. So if you would this morning, would you take the bread? Scripture tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, before he went to the cross, it says he took bread. And when he had broken it, he said, this represents my body that is broken for you. Eat this, do this in remembrance of me. Would you take the bread with me this morning as we proclaim the goodness of God and his sacrifice for us? The gospels also tell us that in the same manner, it says Jesus took the cup It says, and when he had given thanks, he said, this cup represents a new covenant, the covenant of my, new covenant of my blood that is shed for you, for the cleansing of your sin, to give you life. Drink this in remembrance of me. Would you take the cup with me? in proclaiming his death, in remembering his death, in coming around his table to celebrate his death, his sacrifice for us, we are proclaiming that he is the source of life. It is only through his broken body and his shed blood on the cross, his burial in that tomb and his resurrection three days later that we have the hope of eternal life, that we can stand here or sit here today with confidence and say, Jesus is that living water that will satisfy me like nothing else can. Hallelujah. It is only through what we remember today that we can have the confidence to say, Jesus can meet the deepest longings of my heart, the challenges that I face, right? The circumstances that are in front of me, right? The relationships in my life that need correcting, right? The habits in my life, right? The things that I run to instead of him, right? All of those things that are before us that we deal with as sinful people living in a fallen and broken world. The only answer is living water. The only answer is relying on the Holy Spirit of God that indwells us as believers to be that fountain of life that we drink from. How do we do it? How do we continually drink from this spring of living water? I think the words of the Samaritan woman are very fitting here. After her encounter with Jesus, when she goes back to town, she says, come and see a man. Come and see. Church, what if that were your cry for 2023? Jesus, I just want to see Jesus, right? She didn't go back to town and say, let me tell you about how I have now been justified from my sin, how I am now in the process of sanctification, and one day I hope to be glorified anew with him in heaven. No, she didn't say all that. She didn't know all of that. She just knew she had a need that she could not meet and that Jesus met it. 
And she had fallen in love with Jesus. Have you been walking with Jesus for a long time? But if you're honest, you would say, you go long periods of time between drinking from that well of water. That reliance, that dependence upon the Holy Spirit. Today, do you just need to come and see? <laughs> to just see Jesus with clarity, to understand him, to just fall in love with him in a fresh and new way? Do you need to let go of your pride? Are you really good at coming in and playing the part of a Christian and looking the part, but deep down there are so many needs that you are trying to meet by yourself? And today, you need to just lay down your pride like the woman at the well. Rather than looking for quick fixes and workarounds to get what she thought she needed, she just needed to finally say, you know, this part of my life is a mess and the only way it's going to get dealt with is if I acknowledge it and lay it down and give it to Jesus. Do you need to let go of your pride? Do you need to recognize that you are not the source of water for your soul? It is only Jesus. We all need to drink deeply from the fountain of life. So as our worship team comes, we're gonna close our service. This first service today of 2023 with an invitation, with an opportunity for you to respond to God's word. As we say each and every week, I can't tell you how to respond. I can only tell you that when the word of God is opened up and it is preached, it demands a response. You must respond. So how are you going to respond today? If you're a believer here today, maybe your response today it's where you sit or maybe at these steps, using them as an altar to say, Jesus, I confess to you that too many times I try to be my own source of life, but I need to acknowledge my need, my dependence upon the living water that is available to me through the indwelling Holy Spirit of God in my life. And today, at the beginning of this year, rather than make a resolution, I'm surrendering to drink from that fountain daily that you provide. Maybe you're here today and, and you're like the Samaritan woman in the first part of this message. And in this text, you've never drunk from that water. You've never placed your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't have that living water. Today would be a great day for you to respond to the gospel message to say, Jesus, I need you. As our worship team sings this final song, it's an opportunity for you to come. We'll have ministers here at the front who would love to walk you through how you can receive that living water, how you can have the deepest longings in your heart and life satisfied by the only one who can satisfy them. How do you need to respond this morning. Would you stand with me as we pray and then we're going to sing and then we'll be done. Father, would you take your word today and would you use it as only you can? Spirit of God, would you penetrate hearts this morning? Cause us to confront and deal with those things in our life that are keeping us from drinking from the living water that is ours because of what you have done for us. God, would you move? God, would you work? Would you refresh us? Would you renew us? Would you give life to our very souls? In Jesus' name.